Hi everybody, lesson 1.2. What is the structure of Canada's federal system of government? We'll be learning about the prime minister, about the Senate, about the different branches of government, uh, all of that, everything in between and more. So stick around and let's learn something. It is lesson 1.2. What is the structure of Canada's federal political system? As I mentioned in the introduction, today we're going to be taking a look at a few things and we're going to actually start with the branches of government. There are three branches in Canada's federal government, the executive branch, legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And they work together like cogs in a wheel. And um, the, we're going to actually start with the executive branch. The executive branch is the branch of government that usually typically proposes new laws. They put those laws into action and they run the day-to-day -day business of government through various ministries or departments as we will see in a little bit. The legislative branch represents the interests and rights of all Canadians and they also work with the executive branch and they make laws. Then our final branch of government this is the branch that applies and interprets the laws. This is our judicial branch of the Canadian government. At the top of our government, we have the head of state, which is represented by the governor general. On the left-hand side of the image here, we have the legislative branch. This is everybody in the House of Commons and everybody in the Senate, including the governor general. Then we have in the middle of this image, we have the executive branch. This is the prime minister and the prime minister's cabinet, which we'll get to in just a minute here. And then separate, which has no line going from the uh, head of state, governor general, or the other two branches. But we have a separate branch, the judicial branch, and this includes the Supreme Court of Canada. So let's get started with the executive branch. This is your prime minister and the prime minister's cabinet. Our prime minister is the head of the federal government and to become a prime minister is not an easy thing to accomplish. First, you must be a leader of a political party, any political party. You must then be elected from your fellow Canadians in your riding, in your constituency. You must be elected as a member of parliament, MP for short. And then after you've done those two things, then your party, your party has to then win the most seats in the election. And then and only then will you become the prime minister. But we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at the cabinet right now. And the cabinet includes people with different responsibilities for the various different departments, also known as ministries, uh, that exists. So we've got health and finance, fisheries. These are examples. Environment is an example. Immigration and defense. These are all different departments. These are all different ministries that exist uh, within government. And if you are a part of the cabinet, you are known as a cabinet minister. To be a cabinet minister, you must then be a member of parliament. To be part of the cabinet, you also must be part of the same political party that has won the election and the prime minister must assign you your portfolio, your department uh, in order for you to become a cabinet minister and then you are now in charge of that department or that ministry. Along with the prime minister, a cabinet minister runs the day-to-day -day business of government government. So there's various different ministries, as we mentioned earlier. And this allows government to respond to the issues that arise throughout the course of a year, throughout the course of a term that need, uh, that Canadians need to have met. The Prime Minister and the Cabinet, usually they come up with all of the ideas of what laws they want to introduce and how the, the laws that they would want to pass into legislation. But it's not always them that do it. We'll see a little bit later. But the majority of the ideas do definitely come from the prime minister and their cabinet. And being a cabinet minister, this is not a permanent position. So oftentimes, 
um, we will experience a cabinet shuffle is what it's uh, called because that is a time when the prime minister changes their cabinet however and whenever they see fit. Now, all kinds of walks of life can be represented in the cabinet. We can have men and women. You can have teachers, lawyers, doctors, small business owners, you name it. Um, that can be included in the cabinet. The prime minister chooses the cabinet however they see fit. Okay, this is an example, this image here, this is from the 2019 Liberal Cabinet. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of this time, and these are the members that he chose to be a part of his cabinet. We have some ministers represented from Eastern Canada, some from Western Canada. We have men, we have women, we have minorities. We have all walks of life that are represented here in the cabinet. Now, this makes up our executive branch. This picture right here, this is our executive branch. So now we're going to move on to the next part of our lesson, the legislative branch of government. This is our House of Commons. This is the Senate. And this is the Governor General. So let's start at the top here. Let's start at the House of Commons. This is your major lawmaking body in the Canadian government. And right now we are doing a representation by population, rep by pop. Think back to a few years ago when you first learned about this rep by pop. And we have 338 seats in the House of Commons, which means we have 338 constituencies, 338 different ridings. Everything in the House of Commons, everything in the House of Commons is done in English and French, but you don't need to know English or French to become a member of parliament because there are translators available as well. The party with the most seats who wins the election uh, forms the government. That is the party that is in power. And that party, they will then create that executive branch, which includes the prime minister and it includes the cabinet. And together they run the various ministries and departments that exist. Now, what if you don't win the election? What if your party doesn't win the election, right? Somebody has to come in second place. Well, that's the official opposition. This is the party with the second most seats. This is the official oppos opposition. The leader of that party is a member of parliament, needs to be elected by their constituents, and has to be the leader of that party. That leader is called the leader of the official opposition. Very unique names, I know. Their role is to basically keep the government in check. They're questioning them. They're challenging them all the time and making sure that the government in power is doing the right thing for the people of Canada. If the government, if the executive branch has a cabinet, and cabinet ministers, while the official opposition also has a cabinet. This is called the shadow cabinet. And this is an individual who is assigned an, a department as well. Now, this person doesn't run the day to day business of that department, but this person watches over the person across the House of Commons aisle from them, whoever is that cabinet minister, and then they question them, they challenge them as they see fit. All the other parties, if you don't uh, form the official opposition, you're just known as the opposition. This image here, you can see back and forth from the early days of Canada's uh, beginnings. Um, it's usually the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party becoming um, the official oppositions in both the House of Commons and the Senate. You can see almost like a pattern taking place there. Now, I mentioned this a few times already, the members of Parliament. These are MPs. These are the people that work in the House of Commons. All members of Parliament are elected by voters, also known as constituents. They come from a riding. This is a constituency, and they take up a seat in the House of Commons. And they belong to all kinds of different political parties. They study and debate. They vote on bills, which will later become legislation, which are new laws. They should represent the interests of their constituents, but it doesn't always work that way because sometimes they also need to consider the wishes of the party that's in power and that's how they will sometimes vote as well. So although they do represent Canadians, 
they also need to represent their party values as well. And this is all done through federal elections. And a candidate will run in all kinds of elections, um, but only the winning candidate becomes a member of parliament. Everybody else is just a candidate. At the federal can at the federal level, most, if not all, candidates are going to be associated with a political party. There are some independents that, yes, will run for government, but an independent will never form a majority government. Um, an independent will never form an official opposition either, and therefore an independent will never become prime minister. Okay. Take a look at some examples of. Uh, constituencies over the next couple of slides. This is from 2019. This is the Edmonton Manning federal constituency. And you can see on the left hand side, we have a picture of Edmonton split into various different uh, constituencies. And in 2019, uh, when the federal election was, was happening, the Conservative Party in Edmonton Manning received over 30,000 votes, which was 55.9% of all those votes. The voter turnout for that year in Edmonton Manning was just under 55,000 out of just under 90,000 eligible voters. We see a couple of parties on here. We see the Conservative Party. We see the Liberals, the NDP, which is the New Democratic Party, and we have the Green Party. But other parties exist in Canada, but in the Edmonton Manning riding, there's only those four that were represented in 2019. All of these parties, well, they all believe in something different. They all believe that their way and their values would be better for Canadians, and that is called a party platform. Every party has a different view on how issues should be solved in Canada. The party platform is the official policy of a political party. And you can go online and you can find the party platform of all of the parties that are running in an election. Typically, the party platform will reflect um, those values that members of that party hold. And the voters will typically, when they're voting, usually will align with the party that best represents their own values and their own beliefs. It doesn't always work that way, but more or less, that's how it will uh, play out. This is an example of a very short summarized party platform for each of these political parties that are in Canada. And there are issues that run down the left-hand side and then going across are all of the different um, views and values that each of these parties represent or hold for those said issues. Canadians will take a look at these party platforms, they'll vote based on these party platforms, they'll go to an election on election day or advanced polls or mail-in polls, and they will cast their ballot to see who is going to make the next government of Canada. Now, what governments want, what parties want, I should say, not government, but what parties want, parties want a majority government. This is what they want. There are 338 seats, 338 ridings that exist in Canada, and the parties that are running in an election, they want to get the majority. They want to win 170 seats. They want 51% of the House of Commons. If they have 51% of the House of Commons, they can pass almost any law that they want because when it comes to voting, their party is always going to vote in favor of what they are planning or proposing. So therefore, there'll be a uh, little chance of this vote kind of falling or not passing. They can't be prevented because they hold the majority of the vote. And usually, it'll last approximately Four years. This is an example, this image here from 2015, where the Liberals had a majority government at 184 seats, and the Conservatives made up the official opposition. They had 99 seats. I'm not sure how well you can see this uh, with that blue on the black, but they had nine, 119 seats. So what if you don't get a majority government. Well, then you get a minority government. 
this is what you don't really want. You want to get that 51% mark in your uh, election, in your votes, but it doesn't always happen. And uh, if a political party doesn't win the most seats, but they still have more seats than everybody else, they still form the government. This is called a minority government. And if they want to pass any kind of legislation, then they are going to need the help of other political parties to do so. So in a, in this situation, there will be a lot of compromise when it comes to legislation and the parties will work more closely together because not one party can dictate exactly what will be passed. A minority government can be defeated if the Commons shows a motion of non-confidence. That is, if the bill that they are trying to pass doesn't get 50% of the vote, then the um, Prime Minister and the Cabinet must resign, so that government must resign, and then we will have another federal election. An example of a minority government is what happened in 2021. The Liberals were hoping to get a majority government, which would be 170 seats. They were not able to get 170 seats. They got 158 seats, so they were shy of that 170 mark. And the Conservatives here, with 119 seats, um, make the official opposition of the 2021 election. We have in Canada a winner-takes-all approach. We don't do popular vote. What we do is winner-takes-all, representation by population. When I talk about popular vote, I talk about the total votes cast, cast that are that are cast in an election. But we don't use popular vote in Canada to determine our seats. If we did, this would not be representation by population. This would be proportional representation. This is an example. This is from Prince Edward Island, where the Liberals are going to be uh, getting the majority of their of the four seats that are there, they are going to grab three of those seats, even though the Conservative Party has a more popular vote. But for each of the ridings, you can see in the first riding, riding number one, the Liberals won that riding because they had more votes within that riding. Riding number two, the Liberals won again because they had more votes within that riding. They also won riding number four as they had 500 more votes than the second place Conservatives for that riding. Riding number three was a conservative win. They got 11,000 votes compared to the Liberals' 6,000 votes. When you add up the popular vote, the Conservatives have 33,000, whereas the Liberals have 31,500. But when you're looking at the ridings, the Liberals win three to one, and the Conservatives then get a quarter of those seats that are there. We can see some seats versus popular vote. This is from 2015. You can see that um, the seats that the Liberals won, 184 seats, and they got 39.5% uh, of the uh, popular vote. They got the majority of the seats, and they also got uh, most of the popular vote. The official opposition, the Conservatives, they got 29% of the seats and they got 31.9% of the popular vote. So they formed, in the in this case, in 2015, the Liberals formed a majority government. They got over 170 seats. In the next example, from 2019, we can see here that the Liberals formed a minority government. They got less than 170 seats, but more seats than any other uh, political party. But for popular vote, they did not get the most, uh, they did not get the popular vote. They got the second most popular vote. The Conservatives in 2019, with 121 seats, got 34.4% of the popular vote, whereas the Liberals got 33.1% of the popular vote. That's a lot to wrap your head around. That's why these lessons are on YouTube, so you can go back and take a look at this as you see fit. All right, we talked about the executive branch. We talked about the legislative branch. Well, let's head on over to the Senate. This is our Senate. This is the house of sober second thought. This goes back a long ways into tradition. What the Senate does 
is any legislation that passes through the House of Commons then goes directly to the Senate, where the Senate will carefully take a look at all this legislation over again before it actually passes and becomes law. The bills from the House of Commons are given a second round of study. They're given a second round of debate and they get voted on again before they are um, put into legislation. The Senate is supposed to represent the interests and rights of all the Canadians, especially uh, the various different regions that exist, including as well as our minorities in Canada. A bill will not become legislation. A bill will not become law until both the House of Commons and the Senate pass it. The Senate very rarely rejects any bill that makes it through the House of Commons. It does happen, but it's very rare. The Senate can also pass, or sorry, can also propose new laws as long as those laws do not spend taxes or create taxes. Then the Senate can go ahead and can uh, introduce new bills with the hope of them becoming laws. If you're part of the Senate, you're a senator. The Senate only has 105 seats. You can see the breakdown here on the map of Canada. A senator is not elected. Instead, the prime minister advises the governor general who should fill an empty Senate seat. You can stay as a senator up until the age of 75 or until you die. And it can, uh, or you can, if you are a senator, you can represent a political party. It's a pretty good job. If you can become a senator. You're there until 75 or you're there until you die. Those, that's, uh, that's not a bad job. So let's take a look at what some of the similarities and differences are um, between the members of parliament and the senators. Members of parliament elected by voters. Senators appointed by the governor general. They both work for the federal government. Members of parliament sit in the House of Commons. The senators, they sit in the Senate. And both the House of House of Commons and the Senate need uh, to pass bills to become laws in order for that for legislation to take place. Members of Parliament, so the House of Commons has 338 seats, the Senate has 105 seats, both have ties to political parties. The members of Parliament definitely have ties, the Senators don't necessarily have to. Members of Parliament are known as MPs and they serve terms, typically lasting four years. Senators, you're there until you're about 75, or until you're 75 or you die. Both work in Parliament. So the House of Commons is determined by representation by population. And for Senators, this is determined by regions. If uh, Senate seats are open in Alberta, for example, then uh, usually, typically, um, they are obviously, they are going to be filled by uh, Albertans. And both can introduce legislation, although Senators can only introduce legislation if it is not spending or creating new taxes. Members of Parliament in the House of Commons, they represent their constituencies their constituents and the party that they belong to, whereas senators represent the region where they are from and minorities in Canada. We haven't talked about another part of um, all of this, and that is the governor general. At the head of Canada's government, we have the British monarch, and that person that represents the British monarch in Canada is the governor general. It's appointed by the British monarch themselves on the advice of the prime minister. And before a bill can become law, it has to have something called royal assent given by the governor general. It's a stamp of approval saying, yes, this is a good law. This passed through the two houses, the House of Commons and the Senate. And now this is now an official law in Canada. The role of the Governor General is highly symbolic. Uh, very rarely does the Governor General exercise their power, uh, but it has happened before. I think it happened like the 1930s when uh, Mackenzie King wanted to dissolve Parliament and run in an election, and the government, Governor General said, yeah, wait a second, no, no, because the official minority, or sorry, the official opposition is able 
to create the government. Other than that, the governor general doesn't really exercise their power too much. Executive branch, legislative branch, we're missing one. If you're still here and paying attention, you're missing one more branch. That is the judicial branch of Canada. This branch is independent from the other two branches. This branch interprets the laws, applies the laws by making legal judgments, usually based off of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Our Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the country, and they have uh, on the Supreme Court nine members that serve. These are Supreme Court justices chosen by the Prime Minister, and it's nine because you can't have a tie um, if there is any kind of disagreement that needs to go to the Supreme Court. It has to be a uh, majority declaration. The judicial branch acts as a check on the powers of the other branches. It ensures that the power is not abused and especially that the powers are not unconstitutional. Like I mentioned earlier, they specifically usually deal with cases that are charter challenges. That is, cases that are pertaining to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And there you have it, the three branches of government. Let's see if you remember what they are. We have the executive branch, which includes the prime minister and the cabinet. We've got the legislative branch, which is the House of Commons and the Senate. And then we have the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court. All right, I want you to head over to your notebooks and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.